it has endured. Our long national nightmare is over. Give me a break. That's a bunch of malarkey. Welcome to a special edition of Planet America, marking 20 years since the 9-11 terrorist attacks. I'm John Barron. And I'm Chazda Chidello. This week, we will take you inside the presidential bubble on 9-11 with one of George W. Bush's top advisors. We're also going to speak to a former 9-11 commissioner about the new investigation into who helped the hijackers. And we'll reveal just who were the five worst presidents in history. I'm going to have an economic update. We're going to have more on the Texas abortion case. There's COVID news. There's so much more. But first... President Joe Biden is leading commemorations this weekend, marking 20 years since the 9-11 Al-Qaeda terrorist attacks on the United States. 2,753 people were killed after two hijacked airliners were crashed into the North and South Towers of New York's World Trade Center on the morning of September 11, 2001. More than 200 others were killed when a third plane was crashed into the Pentagon building in Washington, D.C. A fourth plane was brought down in a field in Pennsylvania. President Biden is attending services at memorials at each of the three sites. But for a moment there, Joe Biden was facing something of a PR disaster. First responders, survivors and the families of 9-11 victims are telling the President of the United States to stay away from next month's 20-year memorial events unless he fulfills a promise. That promise was made on the campaign trail last year when Biden said that he would declassify FBI documents relating to their investigations into 9-11. Survivors and victims' families are taking civil action against the government of Saudi Arabia, who they believe may have helped some of the hijackers, most of whom were Saudi nationals, and may even have been complicit in the attacks themselves. Last year, Attorney General Bill Barr reneged on a promise from President Trump to release that information, telling the judge in the case further disclosures about Saudi connections in the 9-11 plot would imperil national security and argued that even its justification for the secrecy needed to remain a secret. It was a case of, we can't tell you and we can't tell you why we can't tell you, but then... Last week, President Biden directed his Justice Department and other federal agencies to declassify information gathered during the investigation into the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Well, not quite. Biden's executive order instructs the Department of Justice and other agencies to review the FBI documents for potential declassification and requires current Attorney General Merrick Garland to release the declassified documents publicly over the next six months. But there are no guarantees that all of the documents will be declassified or released. In a statement issued after he signed the order, President Biden indicated that he was pushing for transparency where possible, saying information should not remain classified when the public interest in disclosure outweighs any damage to the national security. The Saudi government then issued a statement of its own, saying... Previous declassification of materials confirmed the 9-11 Commission's finding that Saudi Arabia had nothing to do with this terrible crime, calling claims to the contrary false and malicious. For more, we're joined by Bob Kerry, former Nebraska Governor, Senator and Democratic presidential candidate who served on that bipartisan 9-11 Commission, which was appointed to investigate the attacks and recommend ways of preventing future attacks. Senator Kerry, welcome to Planet America. Nice to be with you. It was only last year that the US Justice Department said that national security meant we couldn't tell you what was in those FBI files. Knowing what you know, what do you think might be in there? Well, I don't know. Uh, I mean, that, that's the problem. I mean, you, uh, the attack on the United States was a conspiracy. And the more you withhold, the more people tend to develop an alternative conspiracy. So we just don't know. I mean. It, it is signally important that the first planes that left the United States after this attack were full of Saudi citizens. Um, so it does invite suspicion. And so I'm glad that Biden has declassified these documents. The more he decla declassifies, the more likely it is that uh, people will get comfortable understanding what happened. And if there's a, if there's a claim, a legal claim against the Saudis as a, as a consequence of their either direct or indirect participation, then they'll have to write a big check, and they should. So 
Uh, we'll see, man. I, I don't, I mean, I'm glad that he's declassified it. I think it tends to decrease his suspicion, not eliminate all of it. Um, and give the, uh, you know, the families, I think, an opportunity to go to court with a, with a better case. Senator, is there more there that you'd like to see declassified or is it pretty much all out there now? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's the problem. I mean, the, 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 you're not trying to determine if there was a conspiracy. You're trying to, uh, trying to determine the nature of that conspiracy. And there's all kinds of things. The 911 Commission simply were not able to, to analyze, mostly because the clock ran out. We had subpoena powers. I don't hold me the date till like July 2004. And when that clock ran out, we, were, we became a former commission. So it, it, there were lots of questions that we couldn't answer that we uh, basically included in our report with the hope that uh, Congress uh, would, continue, would, would follow up. It was very difficult to do as long as this stuff wasn't declassified, and now it is. And I think, as I said, I think it's going to, at the margin, reduce the uncertainty that people have about what actually happened, what, what, what conspired that, and I think it matters. Senator Kerry, you, you mentioned those plane loads of Saudis that were allowed out of the United States in the hours after 9-11. Why was it that there weren't more co-conspirators with the hijackers found, leading to these concerns that there may be some kind of cover-up? I, I can't answer that question. I don't know. Um, I mean, we, we reached the conclusion... Uh, that we were uncertain. We didn't reach the conclusion that the Saudis were responsible for this or that they were indirectly responsible. We reached a conclusion that we didn't know. And that's still my conclusion. Um, so I, I, I think the declassification, particularly on the benefit of the, of the families, is a really important thing for Biden to have done. To finally, and, and if there's anything left, he should, he should, he should cough it up and, and provide it to the, to the public, particularly the families who may have a legal case in federal court. Um, they haven't been able to get a federal judge to allow the case to go forward, and maybe now they will. Now, the 9-11 Commission has, in hindsight, taken on this wonderful, magical glow to all. Are you happy with how it was actually run, and are there ways that it could have been run better? No, I don't think it could have been run better. I think it's a, in some ways it was an accident, uh, uh, because uh, the, the first two people that were selected to be the co-chairman uh, couldn't do it, um, George Mitchell and Henry Kissinger, and so it, you know, it, it, it fell to Tom Kane and Lee Hamilton. Um, it was a really partisan time. It's 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 more polarized today than it was more partisan, and it was the Congress had thought that they had done the job. And the families put pressure on. And they finally agreed to do it. They didn't really want to do it. They didn't want to have this commission. The administration didn't want to have the commission, but it got created. And as I said, as circumstances. Got, we got lucky. We got Lee Hamilton and, and Tom Kane, and they were, you know, they were as nonpartisan you could ever find two people to be. We had five Republicans and five Democrats on this commission, and it was really, really well staffed. Senator, in the lead up to this weekend's 20th anniversary, there have been a lot of reflections, lots of analysis of the last 20 years. What, in your view, were the principal lessons of 9 11, and were those lessons learned, do you think? It's a good question. I, I do think the lessons, the primary lesson that was learned, because you know, we, we, we do have a, I, I think, a, a much better organized federal government uh, on the national security side than we had before, and zero tolerance for people who were threatening uh, either the United States or Australia or other, uh, uh, you know, even, even the Saudis have been attacked since. So um, nobody, uh, other than the people perpetrating them, believe that terrorism uh, as a tactic, and that's what it is. You know, to to say, uh, you know, my tactic is I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap myself with, with explosives and blow it up at the uh, as we're trying to evacuate people out of Kabul. That's very difficult to defend against, and it produces terror and anger and all kinds of things in its aftermath. It's a it's a tactic, and it's very difficult to defeat the tactic. Um, the way you do it, in my view, is what we're essentially doing, which is identifying people who are who are a part of these groups and saying to them that there's no safe harbor any longer. No matter where you are on this planet, you don't. If you're, if you're going to use a, if you're going to use terrorism as a tactic to disorient, uh, no matter who it is, it could be the, I said, the United States, Australia, the, the UK, it can be anybody, it can be Saudi Arabia. Then we're even the PACs don't like it any longer. So I think there's a general recognition that this use of terrorism, especially suicide uh, bombing, uh, we have to draw a line and say there's zero tolerance for it. And I think we have.
Santa, as America wraps up its wars, that could see America moving back from a war footing as far as legally pursuing terrorism goes and moving back to what they used to call a law enforcement footing. Does that worry you or do you think it's time? So I think we've learned from overreact. We went too far after, after uh, you know, after 9-11. There's, no quite, there's ample evidence that we went too far. I don't think that's, I, I'm not worried about that personally. And I'm not worried that, that we're going to become withdrawn. I mean, I did say two things in that regard. Uh, one of the big questions, oh my God, China's killing us. I said, okay, how long is the line of human beings on this planet that are trying to get into China? And how long is the line of people trying to get into the United States? It's a very long line trying to get into the United States and a very short, if non-existent line trying to get into China. So I'm not worried, and, and primarily because their idea of centralized planning and centralized control and shutting down free press, it's not going to work. It never has and it never will. In the, in the end, it will stifle innovation. In the end, it will make it difficult to do what they have to do, which is still move a tremendous number of people off of, you know, basically subsistence agriculture into the cities and create, it just isn't going to work. The idea of allowing people the maximum amount of freedom, you know, it's the most important idea in the last 300 years. Uh, it works. It's difficult as hell. Uh, uh, it's not easy to make it work, uh, but it works. And I, so I'm, I'm not worried about that at all. And I, and I, I think our military has got to change. I think the threats are different than what we faced in the past. Um, uh, you know, I, we don't have to go down memory lane and beat ourselves up over the mistakes made in, in, in Afghanistan. We can say, we, don't, we can't build nation states. That may be, but we didn't go there for oil. We didn't go there for, for, for land. I mean, who the hell wants to own Afghanistan? We did it so in order to be able to let women uh, go to school, in order to let people make free and independent decisions. You can say it was a mistake, but I don't think you can say our motivation was bad. And I don't think that motivation is going to disappear. It's unlikely we're going to ever go, want to, in the foreseeable future, go back into the major military force to try to build a nation. But I don't think the United States of America is going to become a less free country uh, as a consequence. Senator Bob Kerry, thank you very much indeed for being with us on Planet America. You're welcome. And we'll have more on the 9-11 anniversary shortly. But first, to other news, and the fallout continues following last week's Supreme Court decision not to halt a Texas law banning abortions after just six weeks' gestation. The lawsuits are flying thick and fast in the Texas state court system this week, blocking individual anti-abortion activists from enforcing the ban. The matter is destined for the state Supreme Court and the Federal Justice Department has just filed a civil lawsuit suing Texas with the US Attorney General Merrick Garland describing the abortion ban as unconstitutional. So, it seems ultimately this is headed back to the US Supreme Court. As well as the heartbeat provision, so-called, the Texas law prevents termination of pregnancies after six weeks, even in cases of child abuse, incest or rape. But don't worry, because Republican Governor Greg Abbott says he's got that covered. Texas will work tirelessly to make sure that we eliminate all rapists from the streets of Texas by aggressively going out and uh, arresting them and prosecuting them and getting them off the streets. So goal number one in the state of Texas is to eliminate rape so that no woman, no person, will be a victim of rape. Woo! Eliminate rape! Woo! It's so obvious, really. I'm astonished that nobody ever thought of doing that before, Chad. Especially Greg Abbott, who was Texas Attorney General for 12 years before he was governor. What was he doing? Look, to be fair, Abbott also did suggest that any rape victims have six weeks to get an abortion. But as we know, they don't really have six weeks. The six-week clock starts to run from their previous period, so they may only have two or three weeks. They may not have even found out they're pregnant before six weeks is up, so that is a little bit weak. Yeah, it sure is. But the politics of this is pretty fascinating because both sides right now think they're potentially onto a big winner here. It's just the kind of issue to rile up their respective bases ahead of next year's midterms and also important governor's races like Virginia this year. It is actually quite tough to know how this would actually play out electorally because on one hand you've got the polls and there's been very consistent majority support for at least 30 years to not overturn Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade support is currently 58% and the support for generally legal abortions throughout the first trimester, that's 12 weeks of pregnancy, has been even greater. It stayed consistently above 60% support for that. But those are both national figures, not swing state figures. And also, 
We've seen in the past that who's actually motivated enough to turn out to vote for an issue can be a very different factor and it can be hard to predict. So I might just stick to the basics. No predictions today. This law is facing some serious issues though. A Texas court almost immediately blocked Texas right to life from using the law to sue abortion providers at Planned Parenthood. So far, the, the court freeze is for two weeks, but that might yet be extended as they work through the many legal issues raised by this legislation. That case may well end up at the Supreme Court for a full hearing this time. John Ory mentioned the Department of Justice have their own lawsuit going on as well that will probably also end up at the Supreme Court. Also, when Texas Right to Life tried to set up a page where citizens could snitch on people getting abortions so they could, quote, ensure that these lawbreakers are held accountable for their actions, bearing in mind that abortions of non-viable fetuses are still legal, according to the Supreme Court. Anyway, the host of this whistleblower website, GoDaddy, booted them off for violating their terms of service. So they moved that website to Epic, who had previously supported other websites rejected by Big Tech, but then Epic booted them off as well, also saying they'd violated Epic's terms of service. I think collecting private information about unsuspecting third parties, generally a no-no on the web. So we'll see what happens there. Meanwhile, the Texas legislature, they're not done yet. They're now cracking down on buying pills for medical abortions as well. You can currently have a medical abortion in Texas up to 10 weeks of pregnancy, but they're trying to make that limit seven weeks instead. They've already passed the bill. It's gone to Greg Abbott's desk to be signed. Finally, no red state culture war issue is complete without the contribution of the Satanists. As an expression of our deeply held beliefs, the Satanic Temple has created a religious ritual that involves terminating an unwanted pregnancy during the first trimester. The ritual provides spiritual comfort and affirms bodily autonomy and self-worth. The Satanic Temple proudly announces to all of its followers that within the states that have enacted the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, religiously performed abortions are exempt from legal requirements that are not medically necessary. Okay, so I'm not sure you're following that. They're claiming a religious exemption for abortions in states with religious freedom acts, which are... Red state. Satire as a legal ploy. Exactly. And they're going to force Texas, they're seriously going to sue them and force Texan courts to choose between two conflicting conservative legal standards. Judges usually, though, have no problem being blatant hypocrites when it serves their partisan purposes. So let's see what happens this time. Yeah, indeed we will. An update for you now on California's recall election process. Next Tuesday, voters will decide whether to get rid of the incumbent Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom or not. If they do, they then have to decide who to replace him with. We've talked before about this rather peculiar process. The recall came about after a petition was signed by more than two million Californians, a lot of them pretty angry at Gavin Newsom's handling of the COVID pandemic. And polls back in June and July were getting a little bit worrying. For Gavin, in recent weeks, though, there has been a flurry of attack ads tying his top Republican rival, radio shock jock Larry Elder, to Donald Trump. What's at stake in the September 14th recall? It's a matter of life and death. With Delta surging, Gavin Newsom is protecting California, requiring vaccination for health workers and school employees. The top Republican candidate? He peddled deadly conspiracy theories and would eliminate vaccine mandates on day one. Well, that seems to be doing the trick. Gavin Newsom has now opened up a double-digit lead in the average of polls. As he should, really, California is a heavily Democratic state that Joe Biden won last year by almost 30 points. Remember, though, Newsom does need 50% plus one to yep. survive. So his margin is not as big as it seems on those polls. It's only three or four points. Having said that, Republicans have problems of their own. And what do you think happens in California? Well, it's probably rigged. They're sending out all ballots. It's all uh, the, the the ballots are, you know, mail out, mail in ballots. The one thing they're good at is rigging elections. So I predict it's a rigged election. Let's see how it turns out. OK, nothing new there. Mm. But you don't want Republicans thinking mail in ballots are rigged before they vote. Otherwise, they might not vote. Mm. So California Republicans have had to launch a campaign to convince conservatives to trust the mail-in system. After all, they're acknowledging concerns about election integrity, mind you, but 
they're still hoping to convince Republican voters to trust the system. <laughs> Sounds like an Escher diagram to me, John. Yeah, it sure does. Don't say it's rigged until after the election, <laughs> Mr President. Now, for more on this weekend's 20th anniversary of the 9-11 attacks, Dan Bartlett was one of George W. Bush's closest advisers for many years. He was White House Communications Director and Special Counselor to the President. And he was with President Bush on the morning of 9-11, on that visit to an elementary school in the state of Florida. And it was while President Bush was listening to students reading aloud that the second plane hit the World Trade Center and it became clear to everybody that was seeing it that America was under attack. Dan Bartlett, welcome to Planet America. My pleasure. I mean, Dan, that was such an incredible moment that you witnessed in person. The President of the United States being told in real time America is under attack. He's sitting there listening to a kid read a book about a pet goat. He doesn't spring up and leave the room. All the reporters up the back know exactly what's happened and they're just focusing in on this sort of quizzical look on his face. Why didn't he leave? Yeah, we talked a lot about that and I think what was going through his mind was that, you know, here we are uh, on the very early tip of a, of a massive crisis. At this point, we still don't know to the extent because the plane had not hit the Pentagon. Flight 93 hasn't, you know, plummeted into the ground. Um, but we knew obviously this was a, 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 a president, a presidency um, becoming fundamentally different in the minutes that we're standing there. In the seconds in which in his mind he's like i have you know my tone my uh demeanor matters and um his first instinct was not to panic or to appear to be panicking by rushing out of the room and so his thought was was to gather his thoughts as it was concluding and and to not show uh, a sense of panic and so Understanding that that is a split second decision, one that has been criticized in some quarters, understood in others. Hindsight's 2020. Probably, if you did it again, you would calmly interrupt the teacher and and say, you know, there's a, an emergency for me to to attend to. But in the scheme of things, as things were unfolding, it's hard for me to say that it would have altered much of what happened or transpired in the minutes after that. So, Dan, you were in charge of the president's communications on that day. With everything else going on, a terrorist attack, concerns about the president's physical security, continuity of the office, how are you managing the communications task itself? That was our biggest struggle because, you know, obviously the first instinct is to show the commander-in-chief in charge and on top of it, uh, but their institutional responsibilities of the Secret Service and others, which is to protect the presidency, regardless of who the president is. And in some cases, um, their protocols can, in certain circumstances, uh, be irrelevant to what the president himself desires. And we were learning this in real time, which was incredibly difficult because as we were trying to get access to information so we can make a, a, an informed decision about where best for the president to be, you know, at this time where literally we don't know how many civilian aircraft potentially were being converted into enemy aircraft, missiles, if you will, with American targets. And at one point, we thought Air Force One itself was one of those targets. As the day progresses and as we got to the end of the day in which where the president spoke to the nation, it's time to now start communicating about the contours of what's ahead and, and talking about those who are responsible for this. And one of the biggest decisions we made in that speech in the Oval Office that night was to start articulating the Bush Doctrine, which was at that point, if you harbor terror, and this was a message to nation states, that if you harbor a terrorist, you're as guilty as the terrorist, which was a stark change in US foreign policy and one that was important for us to communicate right out of the gate.
And, and what were the stakes for that Oval Office address on the night of 9-11? I can imagine a nightmare scenario for you would be that the President, after a long, tiring day, maybe the auto cue stops working, uh, the lights fail, he looks confused, he is not projecting strength, which is what you needed in that moment. Um, to have even a few hours is nothing compared to what you typically would for an Oval Office address. We would have days, if not longer, to prepare for and make sure as the, not only the remarks themselves, but the president himself, uh, the ability to rehearse and make sure that he was completely comfortable with the language. We were literally making changes in the teleprompter minutes before he gave the address. And um, I remember vividly standing in the back and waiting for the go light to go on, the green light to go on, and a fly lands on the desk, the resolute desk, and the president slaps the desk and kills the fly and flicks it off. And I'm like, if that's the only thing that goes wrong in the next, you know, 10, 15 minutes, we'll, we'll have gotten out of this thing okay. And so um, the hardest thing really I found, not only on that day for the president, but for all of us was how do you keep your emotions in check? All of us had knew and lost a friend on flight 93 that we, we had learned about hours before. Um, and so there's a range of emotions. Anger is starting to brew within and, and, and what you want in decision making and you want from policymakers is clear minds, uh, structured decision making, all the things you would want to make what you would hope to be good decisions were not afforded to us in that day and the days after. I mean, um, I can remember at least three different occasions in the week, in the three days from that day, as the week transpired, where the Secret Service would literally rush into the room, grab the President of the United States and a select few of us and rush us into the underground bunker because a plane had violated the, the airspace of Washington, D.C. So the, it's it would be an understatement to say we were on pin, literally on pins and needles as far as just the environment in which we're trying to make extraordinary decisions about the fate of our country and the pursuit of ultimately what which is going to be war. Dan, I'm sure you're very familiar with the critiques of President Bush, that he was kind of this accidental president, the goof-off son of a president. He didn't really know what to do until Dick Cheney told him what to do and then he went to war because Donald Rumsfeld thought it was a, a good idea. Tell us about the George W. Bush that you knew and worked with all those years and the strengths and the weaknesses that were revealed in that 9-11 period. Yeah, it's, you know, obviously the critiques, every president has to suffer through them, it's fine. Um, and, and no president is, you look back on the different backgrounds of different presidents, whether they've been successful or some maybe critiqued more, um, almost all of them will probably tell you that nothing fully prepares you for the job. And it's hard enough when it's a, a, a typical day for the first time in our country to be attacked on our sovereign territory uh, outside of Pearl Harbor in Hawaii um, and over a couple hundred years, an extraordinary loss of life. Um, there was no blueprint or playbook for that. And so I think President Bush, in a very short period of time, demonstrated that he was up to the task and the public rallied around him in a way, in an extraordinary way with the popularity that he realized not just him personally, but what he was representing on behalf of the country around the world and how he was gonna conduct this war. That's not to say that everything went right, but if you look at the current president, Joe Biden, and the things he's dealing with, and um, some would say he may, uh, would like to have more experience, but he's showing that first year presidents have challenges, how you meet those challenges and how you adapt to those challenges is what's really important. Dan Bartlett, good to talk to you. Thanks for being with us on Planet America. Yeah, thanks, John. It's a pleasure. Joe Biden is wielding the pen, signing a raft of executive orders today, expanding coronavirus vaccine mandates to tens of millions of American workers. 
The new push will cover the vast majority of federal employees as a part of a larger plan to vaccinate two-thirds of American workers. People with federal contracts will be compelled to be vaccinated, as will 17 million frontline healthcare workers in hospitals that receive federal funds through Medicare and Medicaid. And this reaches deeper into the private sector as well. Joe Biden ordering the Labor Department to draft a rule mandating that all companies with over 100 employees either get vaccinated or get tested every single week. I can see why Biden is out there spruiking a new plan though, John. Mm. YouGov's latest poll has approval of Biden's COVID handling at only 42% compared to 46% disapproval. That's the first time I've ever seen his COVID approval underwater. It used to be in the high 60s. Mm. And this is why. The spikes, they've largely peaked, but cases are still hanging around 150,000 a day. Hospitalizations hanging around 90,000 and deaths hanging around about 1,500. With Florida still being the nation's problem child on about 340 deaths a day on average. And for those doing the maths, that's about 23% of the COVID deaths in America right now. Now, now there are some positives out there for Biden, like, for instance, vaccine hesitancy has fallen to about 17%. It was 32% back in January and 24% in April. But there are some negatives as well. Like, for instance, over 500,000 children have caught COVID in the last three weeks since school reopened. So it's pretty clear that this pandemic is not yet under control. There'll be a lot more school cases yet. That's why Biden is now talking about booster shots. They've certainly been effective in Israel, leading to a four-fold increase in protection from infection and a five- to six-fold increase in protection from hospitalisation and severe disease. Fauci's been spruiking boosters for a while now. I would not at all be surprised that the adequate full regimen for vaccination will likely be three doses. And the administration has also been leaking that they will be approving the use of booster shots in mid-September. Now, that's fine if that's what your science people are recommending, but as it turns out, not all of them were. So last week, we heard of a potential mutiny amongst FDA staff and advisors who view the plan to offer boosters as, quote, premature and unnecessary. Furthermore, two FDA vaccine regulators resigned, reportedly because of anger over their lack of autonomy in booster planning. Now, that sounds like political interference to me. And then this week, we hear about how the plan to offer boosters has been scaled back because regulators need more time to collect and review all the necessary data. Sorry, sorry, hang on. Did they say they hadn't collected all the data yet? Acting Commissioner of the FDA, Janet Woodcock, supposedly argued that it was risky to set a firm date for a booster rollout before the regulators had a chance to thoroughly review the data, some of which hadn't even been submitted yet by the vaccine manufacturers. Do you reckon that might be a little risky? I'll tell you what America doesn't need now, John. Mm. It doesn't need accusations about political interference in the science of vaccines. It really, really (laughs) does not need that. We've had enough of that over the last 18 months or more. (laughs) For the last few weeks, we have been counting down the best and worst American presidents. And in case you were wondering, George W. Bush, who we were talking about earlier, came in at number 29 out of 44. They never stopped thinking about new ways to harm our country and our people. And neither do we. I miss that guy. But still, W finished two spots higher than Richard Nixon, who, of course, resigned in disgrace over Watergate, and one place below Gerald Ford, who was never actually elected to the presidency or the vice presidency and stumbled his way out of office after fewer than 900 days. Well, this week, we are getting down to the very worst of the worst. But first, a quick recap with Countdown's Gavin Wood. Coming in at number 10 this week, Zachary Taylor. Steady at number 9, Herbert Hoover. Coming in at number 8, Warren G. Harding. Now, lucky number 7, Millard Fillmore. Coming in at number 6, John Tyler. 
Coming in at number five, he died after just 31 days in office. But he's still somehow better than the next four guys. It's William Henry Harrison. When this 68-year-old was elected, he was the oldest ever president, and he remains the shortest serving. A former army general nicknamed Old Tippecanoe after a famous battle with Native Americans in 1811. His campaign slogan was Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Running for the Whig Party, they beat Democratic President Martin Van Buren. Harrison gave a two-hour inaugural address on a cold, wet March day without an overcoat. Pretty soon he was showing cold symptoms, then pneumonia, then he died. Experts now think Tippecanoe's actual cause of death is probably typhoid. The White House water supply was downstream from a public sewerage outlet. His best rating is for moral authority, worst for economic management and international relations. But what do you expect in 31 days? And now, the one you've been waiting for. Turns out, he's only the fourth worst president in history. Goodbye. It's Donald J. Trump. Businessman and reality TV star Donald Trump was the first president elected without political or military experience. And it showed. You are fake news. Historians have not been kind to Trump. They consider him the worst ever on moral authority and administrative skills. You can't do that. The second worst ever on international relations. Third worst ever on relations with Congress and performance within the context of his times. And allows his score for crisis leadership too. His best ratings are for public persuasion and economic management. You're fired. Coming in at number three, the best thing he did was give Hawkeye from MASH a couple of his names. It's Franklin Pierce. So, what made Franklin Pierce so bad? Worse than Trump or a guy who died after 31 days? Like Tyler, Taylor and Fillmore before him, Pierce's presidency edged America four years closer to a cataclysmic civil war. A Democrat who feared the mostly northerners who wanted to abolish slavery would destroy the United States. America's westward and southern expansion continued and with it the question over whether the new states or territories would allow slaves or not. Pierce was a forgettable president who later drank himself to death. He gets terrible scores from historians on every single measure. Number two, the first president to be impeached. And he was a peach. President Andrew Johnson. Second worst president in history came to office after the assassination of the best, Abraham Lincoln. The great emancipator was a tough act to follow and Andrew Johnson made it even tougher by being an incompetent manager and a racist with dictatorial tendencies. He opposed the expansion of civil rights to former slaves and bungled post-war reconstruction. Under Johnson, the Union won the war but lost the peace. Historians give him worst three status in every single category of leadership and Worst ever for public persuasion and relations with Congress. He was impeached by the House, just acquitted by the Senate in 1868, and never won an election in his own right. He was a real dud. Who's bad? Who's bad? Who's bad? Who's bad? Who's bad? And now, number one on the list of the worst American presidents of all time, it's James Buchanan. Who the f is James Buchanan? What's the point of doing a fing countdown send up when the number one is some fing f with that no one knows? It makes no sense. <laughs> okay, point taken, Gavin, but I didn't make up this list. <laughs> The most interesting thing about James Buchanan is that he may well have been homosexual. His partner, former Vice President Rufus King. Gossipers at the time referred to the bachelor Buchanan as Miss Nancy and King as Aunt Fancy. 
The pair lived together for 13 years until King died. As president, James Buchanan did nothing to stop the southern states seceding from the Union to preserve slavery. He left his successor, Abraham Lincoln, a crumbling nation on the brink of a civil war. Historians judge Buchanan the absolute worst ever on half of all the categories. His best performance, administrative skills, and he's still third worst. This is Gavin Wood speaking. Good night, Planet America. You're fired. While we're running hot with numbers, unfortunately not with Gavin Wood anymore, the latest unemployment figures came out this week, with the rate falling from 5.4% to 5.2%. That's nice, but no one's celebrating because the total number of jobs only rose by 235,000, which sounds a lot, but it's less than half the monthly average growth this year of 586,000 jobs. So that means the jobs deficit from before the pandemic continues to be about five and a half million jobs. But if we draw a trend line from before the pandemic, the real jobs deficit is still more like nine million jobs. Now, President Biden has had a clear culprit in mind. There's no question the Delta variant is why today's job report isn't stronger. I know people were looking and I was hoping for a higher number. I'm, I'm sure the Delta variant isn't helping, but there's more to it than that. Because there's literally a record number of job openings right now just waiting to be filled. 11 million of them, significantly more than the number of people who are looking for jobs. So why is that? Well, firstly, it's because a lot of people have left the jobs market. There are 4.9 million more people not working or looking for work than there were before the pandemic. And that was the case before the Delta variant emerged as well. Also, economists have noted a mismatch between what industries have the most job openings and how many unemployed people used to work in those industries. For example, there are 1.8 million job openings in professional and business services, with only 925,000 people whose most recent job was in that sector. Educational health services, same kind of thing. 1.7 million job openings, but only 1.1 million people whose last job was in that sector. And there are similar issues with leisure and hospitality and retail and wholesale trade, a whole bunch of jobs. So we're talking about structural unemployment here, and that is a lot trickier to solve than just a plain old recession. That's a shame, because as of a few days ago, all the extra pandemic-related unemployment benefits were cut off nationwide. Now, it is true that 26 states cut these off a few months back, but that still leaves 7.5 million people who were cut off completely from extended unemployment benefits last week. The same time as the eviction moratorium ended as well, so some people might get evicted. Right. What happens now, though? Some people are hoping that this is going to spur those kinds of people to find jobs, boosting the economy. Unfortunately, though, we can look to studies of what happened in the first 26 states to see what might happen in the last 24 states. Out of the 1.1 million people who were studied who lost benefits, only 145,000 of them found jobs. The average worker in the study lost $278 a week in benefits, but they just gained $14 a week in earnings. So they then cut their spending by $145 a week, which then put less money into their local economies. Now, whether those results are replicated now or not, we'll see. But nothing is simple when recovering from this pandemic. And it is time for a somewhat overdue fireside chat. And Chaz, uh, we're seeing the toing and froing going on in Washington, largely between moderate Democrats and progressive Democrats, as to just how big this proposed three and a half trillion dollar spending package, which is going to do everything from reinforce Obamacare to save the world from climate change, overhaul the social security system, a cradle to grave answer to all of Bernie Sanders' nightmares. <laughs> Bearing in mind, though, that to get past anything, to pass one Zach, mm. they need all 50 Democrat senators. 
Okay, because they've only got 50 Democrats and there's no Republicans are, are, are joining this ride. Mm. So they need all 50 and don't they know it? Joe Manchin in particular knows it and he's already seen back in Emperor Joe mode going, well, this is what I want, this is what I don't want. This week he came out and said three and a half trillion dollars. Nah, mm. maybe one trillion, one and a half trillion. Look, that's still a lot of money. Yeah, although to be fair to Manchin, it wasn't as definitive as that because he, in the op-ed that he wrote, he said, no, I wouldn't commit to three and a half trillion dollars without greater clarity, yeah. i.e. what's the details, so what's in, what's out. And then it comes down to, you know, what are your priorities? If you're going to start whittling it down from three and a half to one and a half trillion, then, OK, well, we don't save the climate, but we still save healthcare. I should say that's Axios who said that he set a target to Biden personally yeah, yeah. of one to one and a half trillion dollars. Whether that's true mm. or not, I don't know. Kirsten Sinema being the other moderate here who's kind of saying three and a half trillion... Forget that. Yeah. She's also sort of spitballing around that one and a half trillion. Yeah. So is that, do you reckon, is that an irreconcilable problem for Democrats or is that just, this is a negotiation? Yeah, they start, oh, three and a half trillion couldn't possibly pay that. How about one and a half trillion? Oh, couldn't possibly let you have it for half, one and a half trillion. If they get one and a half trillion dollars yeah. worth of goodies, mm. that's huge. Especially start, some of the stuff they got on the table there, like universal pre-K, for instance. That, that's massive. Mm. Right? So that's not a problem in itself. Although Bernie Sanders is already saying, hang on, hang on, hang on. Three and a half trillion, that's already a compromise. I've got six trillion dollars <laughs> worth of stuff that I want to spend. And, uh, and so this is now the bottom line. Ariana Presley, a bunch of House progressives are saying, no, you know, uh, Rashida Tlaib saying, no, we can't go below yeah. three and a half. But the bottom line is they're going to take what they're given by the Senate. They mm. have no choice in the matter. And they've already got a trillion dollars from the bipartisan bill as well. On top yep. of that, let's not forget. The thing, that the concern for me is, and I, I'm pretty sure Joe Manchin's going to play ball. He generally is a team player. But does he mean just negotiation? Like, we're just bartering here, one, one half trillion, two trillion, whatever. Or does he mean what he wrote in that op-ed, which was, the problem is inflation. We need to sit and we need to wait we need, we need a strategic pause to see the effect inflation will have. Is yeah. it going to take off? Now, if he means that, I don't think he does. Well, but Chuck Schumer has said, pause schmores. We're yeah. not stopping. We're, the clock is running out. Well, <laughs> have you looked at the polls? Well, <laughs> we haven't got much time. Yeah, there's no economist who doesn't think it will take months to know where inflation is at, mm -hmm. potentially six months. By that stage, way too late. At yeah. that stage, you're in, you're in the run-up to the mid -term. But this is not $3.5 trillion of immediate stimulus spending. This is nation-building stuff. This even goes... You know, this is the, the human infrastructure stuff. This is the 20-year the time frame stuff of how do we, you know, make sure that everyone's driving an electric car in, in 15 years from now rather than gas guzzlers. That kind of stuff. That's, that's, that's surely not the number one concern when it comes to short-term inflation. Yeah, look, I, I don't... I'm not, I'm not saying that I think inflation is a, is a massive issue when it comes to this bill, because like you say, a lot of these things are way off. Like the spending, they still haven't spent the whole bill from Trump for COVID. Right. They've, they've still got a trillion dollars left over that they haven't spent yet. Some of this spending is years and years away, eight years, 10 years away. So inflation isn't necessarily the major concern at that point in time. Yeah. All I'm saying is from a strategic point of view, Biden's poll numbers are slipping. If people are getting nervous, and there's always nervous moderate senators, if people are getting nervous and they get cold feet, you can, can potentially get a bit of a spiral where they try to save their own skin, and Manchin is in a state which hates Biden. They try to save their own skin by throwing that agenda overboard, and then you get Biden on the nose for everyone, and everyone goes down. Kind of comes down to what's, what's Joe Manchin in this for right now, because we understand that Joe Manchin was probably quite happy to have ridden off into the sunset a few years ago. He didn't mm. necessarily even want to be in the Senate right now as a Democrat in a very Republican state. So maybe this is a bucket list thing for Joe Manchin, whereas Kirsten Sinema, who as a uh, much earlier in her career, about 20 years junior uh, to, to Joe Manchin, she kind of pictures herself as sort of the inheritor of, of John McCain's uh, sort of maverick in the Senate. You can imagine Kirsten Sinema, she could go and at, at, at the very least uh, sit with Bernie Sanders and Angus King as an independent if, uh, if the Democratic Party goes too far for her. It's an interesting one because Kirsten Sinema's not up again for another three years. And Arizona is a very purple state at the moment, mm. but it's very easy to see, maybe not the next election, but the one after, it being very blue. It's becoming blue rapidly. Mm. So she really needs to think about what her future is in that regard, if she wants to be the McCain kind of person. As for Manchin, whether he's running off into the sunset, 
I've heard before politicians say, oh, I didn't want to run, I'm done, I'm yeah. done. I've heard before from Biden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, well, Bob Kerry, who we yeah. spoke to earlier, I mean, he, yeah. uh, 12 years after he left the Senate, he ran again for the <laughs> Senate. <laughs> once, once they were kind of in the business, they don't want to go out of the business. These for guys, they can't do anything else. Yeah, exactly. Hey. All right, then. Now, uh, before we go, Chairs, you got a little bit of malarkey. <gasps> bunch of malarkey. My malarkey is about ivermectin, but it's not what you think. It seems that so many media types are anxious to spike the ball about ivermectin being unproven as a COVID treatment, which it is. Unproven. 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 That they're overreaching a bit. Now, we've all heard about some people taking the horse paste version of ivermectin, not the human version, the horse paste version, it's led to stories like this. Dr. Jason Miguelier saying patients are packing southeastern Oklahoma emergency rooms, taking ivermectin doses meant for a full-sized horse, believing false claims it could fight COVID-19. The ERs are so backed up that gunshot victims were having hard times getting to facilities where they could get definitive care and be treated. Something Miguelier says is now backing up small town ambulance systems too. All of their ambulances are stuck at the hospital waiting for a bed to open so that they can take the patient in. Except as soon as that story came out, one of the hospitals in that area said that that doctor there hadn't worked at that particular hospital for over two months. Also, they hadn't treated any patients with ivermectin complications. That's zero patients who had overdosed on ivermectin. And finally, they said they turned no patients away from emergency care. Then the other hospital put out a statement. They said that they had seen a handful of ivermectin patients in their emergency rooms, but they were merely adding to the congestion already caused by COVID and other emergencies. Furthermore, they suggested that the doctor had said his comments were misconstrued and taken out of context. Really? Yeah, that got me thinking, what exactly did that doctor say again in that report? The ERs are so backed up that gunshot victims were having hard times getting to facilities where they could get definitive care and be treated. All of their ambulances are stuck at the hospital waiting for a bed to open so that they can take the patient in. Now, to be clear, he was definitely criticising the misuse of ivermectin in other parts of that interview. Mm. I saw the roars of it. But in that crucial bit of the interview that was underpinning their whole story, he merely said that emergency rooms were full and ambulances were waiting. Not because of ivermectin. That's right. That's right. He didn't right. explicitly blame ivermectin for that, for that crisis. Now, the journalist did. The journalist put them together. But did they misrepresent the doctor? We, we don't know. There's no way we know where they, they said off the record. Sure. All we know, though, is that there were 459 reported cases of ivermectin overdose across the entire country for the whole of August. 459. And that's unlikely to have been a major factor in hospital bed availability when Oklahoma alone has a seven-day average of 1,528 COVID hospitalizations. So that story there garbage. Mm. As is the story many of you would have seen, it really got around, suggesting that 70% of calls to the Mississippi Poison Control Centre were about ivermectin. No, no, actually 70% of the calls that were about ivermectin were about people using the horsey version. Of course, most people wouldn't call about the human version of ivermectin because that version is largely safe. Mm. It turns out that only 2% of the calls to the Mississippi Poison Control Centre were actually about it's not ivermectin. not nearly as good a story that way, Chaz. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Long way from 70%, though. Mm. Finally, podcast king Joe Rogan is a bit peeved off about reports like this. The uh, podcast host, uh, Joe Rogan, uh, he came down with COVID, he says. He says he's been taking the uh, livestock dewormer uh, ivermectin, uh, as well as other, uh, ver you know, other treatments that pe people talk about on the internet. This was Joe Rogan's response. Bro, do I have to sue CNN? I don't know. I don't know, do you? They're making shit up. They keep saying I'm taking horse dewormer. I literally got it from a doctor. And fair enough, the human version of ivermectin may not help COVID very much, but it is a legitimate medicine. It is not horse paste. So, 
why did I take you on this lengthy journey? Why did you? It's because if we're going to try and convince people not to fall for misinformation, which is everywhere, we really need to do better than all of that in the mainstream media. Because right now, John, we are drowning in malarkey. Indeed we are. Well, that is it for another trip to Planet America. Join me on ABC News on Saturday night for 9-11 Stories. We'll be hearing some extraordinary accounts from survivors, eyewitnesses, soldiers, reporters, political and community leaders. It's quite a lineup we've got for you, from John Howard and Kim Beasley to Mumdu Habib. 8 p.m. Eastern Time, Saturday night. You'll also find it on ABC iView if you're going to watch the footy, but the doggies are going to lose. No, they're not! I go for the dogs. Although, I will watch you on delay. Thank you. We'll watch the ABC. You'll find a new pet podcast right here as well in all the usual pod places. Bye-bye.